could never get very far from the sea in Bucky, for the town has developed all along the shore, from the original small groups of fisher houses that were built in Buckpool, the sea town, and Portessi. Many people in the town get their living from the sea, either directly or indirectly through all those trades and industries that support the fishing. And everyone's very much aware of the sea and its importance to our town. Two hundred years ago, the area was known as Shore of Bucky. That's a good description when you picture the small groups of houses all huddled together with the boats drawn up on the shore. Robert Burns visited the area in 1787 while he was staying at Thorny Bank, and he's left us this poetic record of his visit to Shore of Bucky. Ah, the lads of Thorny Bank, when they get to the Shore of Bucky, they'll step in and tuck a pint to a lady only, honest lucky. Lady only, honest lucky, brews good ale that Shore of Bucky. I wish her sail for her good ale, the best in all the Shore of Bucky. Her house say bean, her curts say clean, I watch she is a dainty chucky. And cheery blinks the ingle gleed, oh lady only, honest lucky. Lady only, honest lucky, brews good ale at shore of Bucky. I wish her sail for her good ale, the best in all the shore of Bucky. Lady only's ale house was a small thatched cottage at the mouth of the Bucky Burn, at what's now called Bridge End. They say she was a bit afraid of the sea, like many a Bucky woman, and when she heard the wind blowing, she used to say to the fisherman, you hear that? You'll no need to go to see the day. You'd better get another chap in a ale. But the fishermen did go to sea from shore of Bucky, and they still do. We've tried to paint a picture in words and music of our town and the sea, first as it is now, and then to take a look back to the past, to see what life used to be like for those who lived at shore of Bucky. I am a fishing skipper and have held the position for 28 years. In Bucky, there are over 100 vessels registered as fishing vessels. They vary in size from 15 to 24 metres. The species caught by these vessels consists of mainly in demersal nature, for example, cod, haddock, whiting, flats. On the other hand, there are about 20% of the fleet engaged in catching prawns. They usually land locally and they help to a great extent in keeping the port financially viable. The sea net and light trawl vessels land most of their catches at Peterhead and they operate all around the Scottish coast. A small percentage operate on the west coast and land at Kinloch Bervie and Loch Inver. The ancillary industries on shore, such as boat building and engineering, have been severely hit by recession and this has created economic and social difficulties in the town. The history of the fishing industry has proved that it has always had peaks and troughs and yet it has survived through all the change. 
In the past decade, an entire herring stock was nearly destroyed, and the fishery had to be closed for a number of years. This was caused by men hunting their prey with all the latest techniques and scientific gadgets, and not realising the disastrous effects. This was, of course, science working in the negative rather than the positive sense. Since then, the fishery has been opened, but on a strictly controlled basis. Of course, in any food producing industry, there is an optimum marketing level. By that is meant the most the market will absorb at economic prices, first to the producer and then to the housewife. If fishing skippers change their attitudes a little in the future, and accept a quota system coupled to disciplined fisheries management, there could be a lot more stability in the marketing structure. If, on the other hand, they do not, and they could find themselves in an unstable situation by causing overproduction, and that in itself can cause market problems. In an industry which depends entirely on biological resources, one must remember that nature does not allow greed nor total destruction. In the end, it always corrects the imbalance. For example, the cost of oil. And oil is, in itself, a biological resource. The industry, as a whole, has been used as a political football by many people. But at the end of the day, it is not politics that will decide, it is simply economics. and casual onlooker Bucky Fish Market in the morning presents a scene approaching chaos and bedlam. Rows and rows of boxes of fish, some perhaps familiar like cod, haddock or sole and others looking like a miniature version of Jaws or the thing from 40 fathoms lie awaiting the arrival of the salesmen and buyers. 
Boats may still be landing and the fishermen are pulling the boxes into the market and separating them into different species and sizes. Firstly, the salesmen arrive and enter the number of boxes and kinds of fish in their books to ensure that each boat's fish is all accounted for. Then the buyers arrive and after they have had a look to decide what they would like to buy, the sale begins. The salesmen know which varieties the different buyers prefer and keep a keen eye on them to catch their bids. A bid can be a wink, a nod, a look, or maybe a nudge, and the salesmen know what to look for. When the fish is knocked down to a buyer, he has the right to take one box or as many as he wants. The runner-up has the first chance of the remainder, then the rest of the shot is put up for sale again, and this continues until all the fish is sold. Then they move on to the next boat's fish. The salesman and buyers keep a note of all their transactions and the buyer puts his tallies on his fish so that his men know to get them loaded onto the waiting lorries and vans. Once loaded, they go off to the factories and fish houses where they are processed. One by one, the catches are sold and removed and in about two to three hours, depending on the size of the landing, all the fish is gone, a couple of hungry seagulls are looking for a late breakfast and peace and quiet has descended once again on Bucky Fish Market. is the main fishing port on the Murray Firth, and its harbour is the nerve centre of the town. As in the past, if the fishing industry is in good heart, then the town as a whole is doing well. At the present time, the harbour is not being fully used by its fishing fleet. Some of the boats, mainly for economic reasons, fish from and land their catches at other ports. The crews, however, travel home normally at weekends, and their boats are serviced and refitted at Bucky. There are three shipyards. The general recession has hit them badly as far as boat building is concerned, but the repair and refitting work keeps them ticking over. Apart from the fishing boats, the yards cater for ferry boats, yachts and the RNLI lifeboats which are based around the north of Scotland. Fish processing plays an increasingly important role in the local economy. There are two large firms with a countrywide and European market. They have been expanding and are continuing to do so. 
equally important is the large number of smaller fish merchants, some of whom take their fish into the remote areas of Rosshire, Perthshire, etc. Bucky has one of the few propeller repair firms in the whole country. Set up to serve local needs, it now provides a service to major ports throughout Scotland and beyond. The most exciting thing about Bucky Harbour at the moment is that part of it is undergoing a very extensive improvement. It involves the deepening of the harbour entrance, infilling part of the West Basin, the one nearest the entrance, and the deepening of the east side of number one pier which adjoins the West Basin. These improvements will allow fishing boats to use the harbour at all states of the tide. Larger cargo vessels than hitherto will be able to enter the harbour, and a marked increase in Bucky's import-export trade is confidently expected, a trade which, incidentally, has improved in the past year or two. It is also hoped that there will be some spin-off from the North Sea oil activities from which Bucky, so far, has not benefited. All things considered, I am confident that Bucky and his harbour can look forward to a busier and brighter future. All the week your man's a war, and all the week you bide your lane, all the time you're waiting for the minute that he's coming home. You can fit why he has to work, you can the oars he has to keep. And yet it marks you angry when you see him just come home to sleep. Through the months and through the years, while you're bringing up the bins, your man's awa to here and there, following the shoals o' oh heron. And when he comes, there's nets to men. You've maybe got a score or two. And when he's done, he rises and says, Wife, it's day my ways are war. Work and sleep and dream your weird. Pen your faith on heron sails. And oft times lie a walk at night in fear and dread o winter gales. And men mon war to earn their breed, and men mon sweat to gain a fee. And fishermen will like a loot as long as the fish swim in the sea. All the week your man's a war, and all the week you bide your lane. All the time you're waiting for the minute that he's coming home. <laughs> Oh
back in 1979 was the start of a spate of tragedies to hit the fishermen of Bucky. I lost my only son, Russell Hilaire, off the Bounteous, down at Penzance on the 4th of January, 1980. We never found his body. I had nowhere to go to pay my respects. So I made up my mind to try and get a room in memory of all the men lost at sea. With the help of Mrs. Nessie Lawson, we started a petition and received hundreds of signatures of people in favour of a room. We then formed a committee in the capable hands of Mr. Murray, a retired skipper. The Kirk session of the South and West Church gave us their small hall in Seatown with their blessings. When the people of Bucky heard of this, they came to our help. The businessmen donated their materials and work. Fishermen and the people of Bucky donated to the cost of getting the room in order. We now have a lovely memorial chapel in memory of our lost ones. In it are lovely stained glass windows designed for us by a local artist. On the walls are lovely plaques in memory of each man lost at sea also a remembrance book. I officially opened the room on the 4th of July, 1981. Next day, we had the great honour of our Queen and Prince Philip coming to visit our lovely room. They both signed the visitor's book and they were most impressed by the inside of the room. Now we have this lovely room of remembrance for our loved ones. Families can now come and pay their respects and bring flowers. You see the rough in Burnie there? That's where the heron fishing at the turn of the early 18th century started. The book of Burn was called the Shore, and round by Jones's slip there was the Slough Shore. Every new and Connie, for Johnny Groats to Land's End, had their wee hamlet of fishermen. Bucky is heron, and heron is bucky. My earliest introduction to the heron fishing was listening to my granda from Peterhead, who, like all his age group, irrespective of fishing ports, had all the same experiences to relate, of launching the open scaffy from the beach, followed by the deck scaffy, then larger sailing boats, Zoli's fifies, which were installed with steam boiler and capstan. Finally, the steam drifter. This was at the turn of the 20th century. Oh, it was a fine and a pleasant day. Out of Yarmouth Harbour he was playing As a cabin boy on a sailing lugger For to hunt the bonny shoals of hell Oh, they fish the swarm and the broken bank He was He'd a water shaving, and he used to sleep standing on his feet, and he dreamed about the shores of heaven. Oh, they left the home grounds in the month of June, and few canny shields they saw.
Fishing in my early days was very hard work at times. Hauling a fleet of herring nets could be a long, tedious job, which required a lot of physical strength. We truly had to earn our living by the sweat of our brow. On most occasions it was toiling all night and catching nothing, which caused an awful depression in most members of the crew. It was known in the fishing industry as heron fever. The only remedy for the patient was a lovely shimmer of heron, nothing like a crown or two, to see these same men pulling with might and main and shouting, Swim up, you lovely silver darlings. Had we but steered out east by north instead of east northeast, we might have heen the biggest shot instead of heen least. Had we but gained the thirty mile instead of thirty twa, we might have gotten twenty crown instead of nina va. It wouldn't have uncle half as bad if we'd had nippers fair, but seeing other folk with shots, fair marks your belly sear. I'm thinking that we've met the cart. She's surely been a bummer. It's scalders, dogs, and bare black yarn. We've teen a proper scunner. There's cures for ills that smit the hurt, the kidneys or the liver. But doctors can't help you if you talk the hair and fever. It brings no pain, this strange disease. But man, it's hard to thaw. A cran the net's the only cure, or else a sucks fit whole. Come, my fisher lassies, I it's come a ball with me. Rise up in the morning, we are bundles in your hands. Be at the station early, or you'll surely hate to stand. Tuck plenty to eat, and a kettle for your day. Or you'll maybe be a hunger on the way to your murky. It's early in the morning. And you look an unkissed, and you greet like a wind when you put them in the breeze, and you wish you were a thousand miles above the Yarmouki. There's coopers there, there's curers there, and buyers can eat cheese, and lassies at the pickman, and the girls at the creek. And you'll wish the fish had been all left in the sea By the time you finish cutting heaven on the Yarmouth Key We've got a fish in where we can then storm the wine and cheese What along the humble amongst the barrels and the grease With the and Grimsby we've travelled up and down But the place to see the heron is the key at Yarmouton But the place to see the heron is the key at Yarmouton Heron fishing was seasonable and followed a pattern In early May you would find the fleet away down by Adbalte and Romney Stacks and they would tress the heron down the east coast, reaching the greatest of all heron ports, Yarmouth, in late September or early October, staying there until late November or mid-December, then home for men's fishing during winter months. All fishermen that went to Yarmouth before the 1914 war must have seen some great sights. Imagine the river year from the town south right down to the mouse trap, full of boats from every port in Scotland plus England and I suppose a third of them would have belonged to the Bucky district, some 400, I should think. On one occasion, all records were broken, when there was an average of about 200 crowns per boat. What a task for the thousands of women got us on the open deans, and the weather getting very cold then. It was 1924 the first time I was in Yarmouth. 
Even then, although the fleet was greatly reduced, many a time it was a problem to get a berth to discharge our catches. Nevertheless, the whole setup gave me a feeling of pride, you might say, of belonging to the fishing industry. Our at the harbour in the bony month of May, dungarees and barky jumpers was the rig of the day. Drifters all bony painted, everything looking brand new, but fits the use of a bony boat if you haven't got a crew. The fish had lost was a smith doggy, built with the very best of steel, a grand boat among the nets, we are seventy fit to keel. Dod Cope was the skipper, his mate was his breather Akes. Now that was the twelfth of the wheel hoose, but fit about the deckies. Jake Flood, Fosky and Robin, Sonny Boson and Jim Dick, all hardy fishermen, and better men you could not pick. Down below was Jock Skipper, a man the best in his class. His partner was Wolke Dumpy, now that's for Mont the fisher lass. It was a rich bony day for laying in, but was guid for everybody's sakes, for there's pots and pans and groceries, kestes, plates and calf sakes. Spare stoppers and buoy ropes, all bony in a kyle, beets, eilies and sewasters, all clorted we bile tile. It was in by Dod Mackenzie's, the butcher, we a hurt like a coo. Correts, neeps and ingans, twa dinners to bile and ain to stew. Geordie Milton's horse and cared, it took a things to the pier. They all horse just snorted and picked, and all that Geordie did was swear. The pier breed was fairly dean, it was just a racial of beans. All but he had to go out and shove, for never were come to the cossay stains. But Dodenaki sorted things out, and saw that nothing was missing. Then nothing was all ready for the summer here in Fisher. Someday 
Round about 1860, the Scoffy, a fishing sailboat of about 30 feet in length, was in most common use in this area. It was undecked, and the physical hardships endured by the fishermen then is hard to imagine, the crew having to sleep between the frames of the open boat with only a piece of tarpaulin to protect them from the elements. Later they were half-decked, and then the Lifeboat Institution promoted fully decked boats by sending examples of decked boats to the main fishing ports. For working hand lines and for use in narrow waters, the Scaffy was regarded as one of the best boats built, as owing to its curved stem and draped stern it could turn very speedily. But by its very shortness of keel, the Scaffy was inclined to broach to in very rough weather and was thus easily swamped. The Fifey, which originated in Fifeshire, had a straight stem and stern, and thus had a long keel. The Fifey was most common in Wick, and from Macduff to the Tweed. Because of its length of keel, the Fifey was able to sail close to the wind, but was not so manoeuvrable as the earlier Scaffy. It was a much larger boat, usually between 50 and 60 feet in length. Both the Scaffy and the Fifey were superseded by the Zulu, which was first built during the Zulu Wars and was a compromise between the Scaffy and the Fifey, having the straight stem of the Fifey and the right stem of the Scaffy. This produced a very good sea boat and was reckoned to be the most graceful sailboat ever built, with her straight stem cutting through the water and the clean lines of her stern leaving very little wake. The Zulu was a much bigger boat, usually between 50 and 70 feet in length, during the fishing seasons, these boats, with BF and their numbers painted large in the sails, were to be seen in almost every fishing ground around the coast. BF was a port registration letters for all boats between Port Gordon and Gamery until 1908, when the bucky boats and those of neighbouring villages were registered BCK. And you see, fisher folk, if you need thing shame to come down to the butchers for a trip and I pain to get Sunday put by your nomical Kieran for all the week run you'll get tatties and heron tatties and heron tatties and heron Buchan Tatties and Peter Heed Heron. No matter in what state the country's economy may be, Bucky's fortunes for the most part depend on its harbour and on what goes on in and around it. It's a harbour that has grown considerably through the years and dreams of yet greater expansion come and go with the tides of prosperity and recession. With the present modest contract for partial infilling and deepening in mind, it's appropriate to look back to the first half of last century, when the best harbour available in this area was no more than a wooden jetty built out from the shore, accommodating boats on either side, or, as was more likely, a simple stretch of beach up which boats could be drawn when rough weather threatened. There were one or two such havens on this coast at Buckpool and Portesi, and the bottom of Bucky itself could shelter a few boats in its last hundred yards stretch before reaching the sea. Such limitations were severely restricting to the activities of a growing fleet, and some of the more enterprising fishermen were even leaving the area for better equipped fishing stations elsewhere. The upshot of this was the building of Netherbucky or Buckpool Harbour in 1855, financed by the Board of Fisheries and Robert Gordon of Letterfury. It was completed in two years by Stevenson, famous for his lighthouses and harbours, and incidentally as history was to show for his even more famous nephew Robert Louis Stevenson. Nothing whatsoever was constructionally l wrong with this harbour, but it wasn't long before the silting up effects of the neighbouring burn of Bucky showed up the weakness of its location. Nothing daunted, a bigger and better harbour, now the west basin of Clooney Harbour, was planned and completed after about five years' work in 1880, at a cost of £65,000. Considering the times, to have conceived, financed and completed these two massive civil engineering works 
within the space of 27 years was quite remarkable for a community smaller than we are now. Perhaps there's a lesson here for us and for those who are now guardians of our harbour. In the intervening years since 1880, the pattern of fishing changed dramatically, as did the boats, and extensions to the harbour followed, first with an additional three basins up to Pier No. 4 in 1913, and a fifth basin making five in all with the West Basin in the 1920s. Around the same period, the North Breakwater was also extended by about a 100 yards beyond the lighthouse. Many fine old fishing harbours around our coasts are slowly decaying, being held from complete collapse by occasional bursts of first aid make and mend. Buckpool, almost beyond recall, was saved at the last minute, thanks to Murray District Council, by using its outer walls to shelter a cleverly designed parkland area, and it still proudly displays the stone plaque proclaiming its origin. Clooney Harbour, on the other hand, for all our economic ills, is still a scene of bustle, and long may that continue. Indeed, when we at last come in sight of that elusive economic corner, who knows, we may be able to realise some of these dreams of further expansion. Somewhere beyond the sea Somewhere waiting for me my lover stands on golden sands and watches the ships that go sailing. Somewhere beyond the sea, she's there watching for me. If I could fly like birds on high, then straight to her arms I'd go sailing. the moon I know beyond the doubt my heart will lead me there we'll meet beyond the shore we'll kiss just as before happy we'll be beyond the sea and never again I'll go sailing And never again I'll go sailing One of the best ways to get a flavour of Bucky and the sea is to have a look round the Peter Hansen Gallery beside the Bucky Library there you will see on display some of the watercolours of fishing life in the Murray Firth that have made Peter Anson's name so familiar in these parts. I first met Peter Anson in the early seven, 1970s when I was chairman of the museum committee in Bucky. Mr George Smith Layton knew that Peter Anson had offered his collection of pictures to Anstruther Marine Museum. They, however, did not have the space to house them. Mr. Smith was instrumental in bringing Peter Anson to Bucky and ultimately having his fine collection gifted to the town. Peter usually stayed with me when he came to Bucky and a very pleasant and interesting guest he was too. Uh, he told us that he first got to know the Murray Firth coast in 1921 while recuperating at Fort Augustus Abbey after an illness. He got in conversation with fishermen going through the Caledonian Canal and was so impressed with them that he decided to visit the Murray Firth coast. This was the start of a long relationship which led him finally to set up home in Macduff from 1938 to 1958. But that first visit to Bucky in 1921 saw him lodged at Kensington in St. Peter's Road, the home of the skipper of the drifter, Janet Reed. His first trip 
to sea was on board the Morning Star when she was making a trial trip. She had just been converted from drifting to sea net fishing. Also at that time, he had a taste of drift net fishing for herring on the Monarch. Although born in England, Peter often said that he liked very much to be considered what he termed Inuus, and his love of the sea and fishing ways led to the vast collection of watercolours now on display and the numerous books he wrote on fishing and fishing customs. I do wish I had known Peter Anson when he lived on the coast, but I still remember him as a dear friend. He was so pleased and proud that day he opened the Bucky Maritime Museum and Peter Anson Gallery in September 1973. His words on that night were, I shall now die happy knowing that my pictures have got a home and are displayed in such a magnificent gallery. He died in July 1975. As you stand on the shore of Bucky and look out to sea, on a clear day you can see for miles, right over to the hills of Sutherland across the Firth. Everything seems calm and beautiful, but when the wind's blowing and the waves rolling in, how different it seems then. Some of the people of Bucky have tried to share with you some of their thoughts about the sea, the hard work, the tragedy, the excitement and the beauty. But the clearest picture of all is the sound of the shore itself. The sound that would be the same for the first fishermen who settled here. The same for those who hunted the herring and the steam drifters. And the same for those who still live and work by the shore of Bucky.